Welcome to What's the Risk, hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can use to better understand index and portfolio performance, along with answering some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on the S&P ASX 300 index total return, end 2023. Some people would know the ETF that seeks to track the return of this index as Vanguard's VAS or VAS. It's generally the 300 largest give or take stocks on the ASX by market cap. Sponsoring ourselves, Your Investment Philosophy, a book we wrote, shameless plug. If you'd like to read it, it's available at Amazon. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say our intent is educational and we're not rendering any financial advice. Don't make us tap the sign. These are simple concepts. It, essentially, there's no point talking about targeting double-digit returns over decades if in 18 months you panic in a correction and sell or if underperformance makes you prone to fiddle because you're not in your seat for that 20 to 30 years, you don't get the returns. Periodic performance, headline numbers looking back, pretty good. And I guess the question I'd ask you, Peter, is it looks great, but sometimes do you see this as a little bit deceptive when you, for the the average investor who um, sometimes looks at these returns and thinks, oh, gee, this is a, a bank account that prints money on a reliable basis? Yeah, the 40-year numbers, indeed the 42-year the numbers, 44-year uh, numbers, which, which basically correlate with my whole experience in the financial advice industry, um, look great. Uh, but in between those numbers, at times, results from share markets, as measured by the ASX 300 here in Australia, you know, can be very, very different to that. You know, in that 40-year period, we've had some colossal downturns that investors really needed to, you know, ensure that they stayed disciplined during to get those sort of returns. And those that didn't stay disciplined uh, suffered badly. And, and some of the other evidence that we might look at would depict that, you know, but, you know, in that 40-year period, times like the 1987 stock market crash, the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, the global financial crisis, COVID and like, there's been plenty of downtimes where returns over short periods of time didn't look anything like the numbers that are on the screen there. It's, it's probably about five years ago now uh, that in... Uh, consultation with a colleague of mine, we actually created a 39-year history of equity markets and we actually found a reason that you wouldn't invest in any one of those years and yet that 39-year result still had a double-digit average return. Our growth of wealth looks fantastic, starting from $1 at the bottom and you end up with uh, 93. Well, you don't necessarily end up with 93. No one actually achieve these returns, but uh, the index with dividends reinvested ends up at $93. It's a simple story of compounding interest. Um, over time, those, those double-digit returns that we saw on the previous page over the 43 years, you know, have generated that double-digit return. And uh, if you were an engineer, you'd probably put a line of best fit through that particular chart and you'd see that you know, there's a bit of a, a hiccup down in 1987 where there were major gains before a substantial fall. Then again, you'll see very clearly in roughly just to the right of the middle of the chart, you know, a huge set of gains before the 2007, 8, 9 global financial crisis. And then, of course, you know, over towards the right, we see the rapid plunge you know, when people were fearful of what COVID might mean to the world and then nearly as fast a recovery thereafter. Um, but the person that actually stayed in their seat for that whole 43-year period um, has actually ended up with very, very healthy double-digit returns. Um, but along the way, there's been some bumps, that's for sure. The range of returns and an average return... I guess you, you could speak to this one because it's something that you obviously use with clients just to underline what can happen from the good and the bad across time periods. Absolutely. Whilst the, the average returns across, you know, the one, three, five, 10 and 20 year, you know, uh, moving timeframes are very, very similar, um, the range of possible results over the shorter periods of time is vastly wider. You know, the difference between the, the worst and best result for the one-year period 
is 126%. Um, but when you move out to the average 20-year period results, picking the worst and picking the best are less than 5% away from the average over that time. So it certainly shows that some investors can be luckier than others, you know, and, and that's really just about whether they, they buy into markets in a downturn or at a high point. Uh, but over time, the difference between the best and the worst results experienced by an investor gets closer and closer to the average. And rolling annual returns. So essentially, this is take one month off the back, put a month on the forward, on the, on the front end, and you've got another annual period. And it shows quite often there's opportunity, I guess, when, when you're down, because if you look at some of the down periods, they're followed by some quite sharp increases in, in one-year periods. Absolutely. In fact, uh, just had a conversation with a client uh, earlier this morning where we contrasted the returns on their portfolio. It only moved on three months, but one particular period had moved three months and it happened to be a period where equity markets boomed. Um, one part of the period had COVID's downturn at the front end and the other period didn't. The difference in the returns for the 12 months, albeit that it was only three months different starting time, was 20%. So, you know, a lot can happen in a short period of time. And as I stressed again with that particular client, um, it's absolutely uh, wise to avoid thinking about very short-term results. To me, another really good message in this particular chart that reinforces what I've just said is, the sheer volume of results above the line compared to below the line. Historic chance of positive or negative return. As time goes on, historically, the chance of a negative return narrows. And the context here, up the top, there's 528 monthly periods yep. counted. And down at the five-year period, there's uh, 469 five-year periods counted and uh, it it's it's another great piece of evidence to to show investors why patience gets rewarded and and why you don't react to short term poor results when you consider the the 528 monthly uh results which are you know in that top line every single one of those negative results is also in the 10 year bottom line so one of these times you had to be patient, the largest fall in time to recovery. And obviously this was in the financial crisis, down 47.5% almost, and it took 73 months to get back to square, I guess. But uh, in saying that, uh, you could say there's some opportunity and risk because you have to be bold to be buying down at the bottom there, but there is some payoff in the end if – Markets do continue to work as we expect and capitalism continues to function. So the, the investor that was accumulating wealth during this period, if they kept investing, then of course, each time the markets fell from October of 2007 through to the end of March 2009, um, the assets that they were buying were getting cheaper. Um, and it's, it's those investments that they made in the downturn that have actually generated the highest returns on the other side of the dip as markets recovered. Uh, for those that are not, uh, or that were not in the accumulation phase of, of their wealth creation, maybe they were retirees, you know, drawing an income. Um, this evidence is what we use to make sure that the investors that that we support and that we guide um, have always got at least their next six years worth of spending in defensive assets like shares and bonds, sorry, like cash and bonds. So it's it's a great message. One, for the accumulator, keep buying. You'll buy quality assets more cheaply. And for those that are in retirement, make sure that you've got safe assets to support your cash flow while equity markets get the chance to recover from falls, which will ine inevitably happen. And the risk-return relationship you're the mathematician, Peter. Would you like to explain standard deviation just so uh, 
people who are playing at home understand if they don't? Sure. Or rather than try and explain a formula, I'll just try and put it in words that uh, a psychology lecturer once shared with me, and that is that the standard deviation is the average distance of each individual score away from the average score. So in this case, we've got 33 years worth of results and you can see cash had an average return of 5%, bonds an average return of just under 7 and Australian shares an average return of 9 But as you pursue those higher rates of return by investing in fixed interest or bonds or into equities, then you have to accept that each individual yearly result has the potential to get further away from the average. That's what standard deviation is about. In this particular case, with the chart that you can see, uh, investors are trading the amount of volatility that they have to experience for the higher returns that they got to enjoy. And sources and descriptions of data for anyone who wants to um, have a look at that. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Cheers.